Matuska Taxidermy Supply Company, Thursday Live. And uh, it's snowy out there today. Yes, it is. And we're going we're gonna to try to squeeze in our, our programming. Um, we're supposed to get six to nine inches, 50, 60 mile an hour winds. Uh, we heard that in North Dakota, there's 90 mile an hour winds, yes. and that makes the snow fly around a lot, and we have <laughs> a ways to deep. drive besides. Yes. So uh, we'll see how, how we can get through this programming today and <laughs> hopefully give you some ideas and, and uh, how to operate your business. Not that in, whenever you watch us, um, we show you a lot of things, and we think we're pretty clever sometimes. Um, <laughs> but you may look at us and say, oh, I've got a way better idea. Uh, we learn things from you people, too, so don't be afraid to uh, text in your ideas or your methods, and we like hearing those and, and like uh, passing them on as well. Last week and the last few weeks, we showed you how to make a reproduction fish. We took a yeah. small bluegill, and we made a mold of it. We bedded it in our bedding material. We uh, uh, made an auto body mold. We made artificial fins. We made a cast of that fish. We put it together, um, started painting on it a little bit last week, and I hope some of you found that helpful. And we can kind of tell those of you that that watch because a day or two later, all of a sudden, people are ordering bedding material and and yes, uh, they do. different resins and things like that. So we know that you're trying out different things and experimenting with the ideas that we showed you, and that's what it's all about. Just um, kind of expanding your horizons and giving you new ideas and and along that line, things not to do because we know a we'll lot of things not to do, and we learn those the hard way. <clears throat> Today, um, we're going to show you um, taking a deer in from a customer, and a little late in the season because most of you have taken your deer in. Um, some people still have deer to cape and things, but uh, um, you may uh, gain a little bit from this and give you some ideas and insight into how we do to make our lives easier in the taxidermy world. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do right off the bat when you're meeting with the customer um, that can solve problems later down the line, you know, circumvent problems. So um, to start with, this is a nice white tail that we took in. And Wait, this isn't one that we had to go fishing last time. Oh, yeah, we had to go hunting yeah. this time, didn't so we? we had to yeah. go hunting. And <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> no. You wish. I do you wish. wish. That's a very I nice deer. That's a big deer. Um, that's funny. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't know if it was a buck or a doe if it was <laughs> one that right. I got. It'd be like a oh. little bluegill. <laughs> but uh, yeah. um, customers typically will call up and they'll say, they'll say, I got a deer I want mounted. And the first thing they'll do is say, what do you get? How much do you get for a deer? I mean, how many times have you heard that? Every we hear it all thing. the time. A lot of taxidermists do not give a price over the phone. You got to come in and listen to the spiel before you will even give out the price. Um, I don't like, that That makes me uncomfortable with customers. So my method is, um, the first thing I'll say is, you're obviously shopping by phone, and we get $745 for a, a full shoulder deer mount. And if you're shopping by phone, you really do want to come in and look what the taxidermist has to offer. Look at the mounts on the wall. Have him show you. And we have a lot of extras that we do to our, our mounts and, and our deer. We're going to have the nostril detail. We'll take a flashlight and show them on one of our mounted deer, one of our customer's deer out in the wall. We'll shine a flashlight in and say, you know, look at that. We'll... Uh, show them a neatly tucked lip line, surface of the nose, all the little nodules built up. We spend extra time doing all of that. Um, the eyes that we use, I like to show them the, the white-based eyes with the scleral band, and I'll have a, a pair of eyes that I can let them hold and, and you know, feel of them and, and touch them and look at the white, white band. Um, nictitating membranes, we show them the nictitating membranes. Show them the the tear ducts and how you how you tuck the tear ducts because they hopefully are going to go to another taxidermist and say the same thing. Um, let me see your deer, and they're going to look at all the stuff that we educated them on. 
Um, I like to have them feel of the ears, look at the ears and how nice and, and nice lines that they have and how the edge of the ear is aligned on the edge of that ear liner. Um, explain to them how you do ear liners over different methods, you know, that might be inferior. Um, there's just a whole lot of um, different extras we do. On the back of our deer, we put a nice cork finish um, that saves the wall. Um, we put a hanger on that extend the Gary Bowen um, hanger. We like That's those. Right. Yep. They actually make the deer, because the hair is not tucked around the back, it makes the shoulders look an inch and a half bigger. Yep. Um, it really is a nice look, and it makes your job easier besides. So there's a whole lot of things that we do to our deer. Um, I love to have them feel the stitches. See where we sewed it up here? Hopefully they'll say, no. You know, that's what you want them to say. You don't want them to find any stitches um, because they're going to go to brand X tax during me down the road, and it's going to look like railroad tracks down there. So I like to show them all of that. Since you're shopping by phone, come in. Let me show you what to look for. Um, show them all this thing and say, if we can be of any assistance to you, um, bring your deer in. And if not, good luck. Um, so, so that's always fun to show people. They get kind of excited about it. And most often they don't go to anybody else. They'll um, bring it in to you. So when they bring it in, then you want to look over what they brought. A lot of them will say, I got a deer last night, and I got him hanging in my barn. Do I bring you a whole deer? Well, yes, you can bring the whole deer, and we will cape it out. Um, we'll bring it right in here on this table or hang it up or do it on tailgate or pick up. A lot of different ways to do it. Um, I, I would rather have it like this. I'd rather have the, the head, provided they don't hurt anything, yeah, um, the head with a little bit of um, neck stub in there with the whole remainder of the cape. A lot of people will say, how much cape should I leave on? How much hide should I leave on? I always tell them to leave the whole thing and we'll cut it off where we want it um, rather than have them cut it off much too short, which we've had that happen. Um, so this is my preferred method. They bring it in, and a lot of times it's frozen. Sometimes it went to the processing plant, the meat locker, whatever it is. And so they'll bring it in, and, and uh, it's in a box like this, so you have to wait for it to thaw out. <laughs> So, you, and when it's frozen, you can't tell a whole lot. You can't tell what's going on and anything wrong with it. So, if it's thawed, I always tell them, if it's frozen, we'll take a look at it. We'll look it over real good. And if there's any issues at all, when we are caping, we'll call you and let you know. <clears throat> they don't want to know when it came back from the tannery with a big bald spot this big in it, six months later that there was a problem. They want to know right away. And it adds to your credibility if you can, you know, tell them that right away. So if it's frozen, thaw it out, deal with it tomorrow. If it's not, um, you want to check this cape over. Now, the first thing that jumps out on me is um, I think this one's got half of an ear over here. So make sure you point that out to the customer that, oh, he's got a half a ear here, and uh, there's a lot of people that bring in deer with big splits in their <laughs> ears that never <laughs> saw it when they got the deer. Um, they have to go back and examine pictures because they don't believe that you got the right cape with them or something. So point out that sort of thing. Remember, um, bullet holes and arrow, arrow holes have to be repaired. That takes away from the girth of the neck. Everybody wants a neck on their deer, you know, like a Cape Buffalo. <laughs> And I would too, but if they got a couple 12-gauge slugs going through the neck, um, that cape gets smaller and smaller and smaller with each repair. So check that sort of thing over. Any kind of um, um, fighting scars, that sort of thing, and point that out to the customer and then write it on his ticket so that it's not a big surprise when he comes in and says, what happened here? Another thing, he may have a an arrow hole. Broadheads are terrible. All of you know this. Um, the entry hole of a broadhead can do a tremendous amount of damage. Yes, you can fix it. No, you're not God. You can, you can make it, camouflage it the best you can. I always tell people, we'll do our best. We can hide it and camouflage it to a point, yeah. but it's probably 
you know, you may see it. And if you see it, um, that's all we can do. Yep. Um, so that sort of thing. Check him over real good. Um, damaged tines. A lot of people want us to um, fix broken tines. We get a lot of that. We do that yeah. a lot, yeah. yeah. And uh, to do that, um, we've done segments in the past of how to do that and we probably will do some more in the future um that's all busy work and you kind of have to figure it on time and materials type of a thing because you could spend hours rebuilding it and the more time you put into it coloration um the more you know hours you put into it also so check that sort of thing check him over real good and then slippage Every taxidermist has been in this business very long knows what slippage is. And slippage is um, kind of epidermal breakdown where the epidermis is decomposing and the hair roots are loosening and come out. So to check for slippage, you're going to want to grab the thawed. It won't work on a frozen hide. Grab the hair and pull it. Don't rip it because you can actually tear the hair out. You want to just pull on it. If hair comes out profusely, like you get a whole big cluster of hair, that's time for concern. And then you want to write that down on the customer's ticket so that he's aware there could be a problem. During the tanning process, that can escalate and you can get advanced slippage to where it can't be saved. So check that sort of thing out too. If he's there, show it to him. Check for slippage right away with the customer in front of you, just in case. It's always nice if they're if they're standing in front of you when you find cropped ears. And And then another thing, um, after you've done this for a long enough time, every animal has its own fragrance. Antelopes smell like antelope. Some people think they stink. I think I I like the smell of an antelope, and and, uh, they have an antelope flavor. Um, Elk smell like elk. Um, Goats for sure smell like goats. But uh, if it's a decomposing odor, then check really close and ask the customer if you find any slippage at all or if he does not smell fresh, kind of get a feel for how they harvested him. And if you hear something that says, "Um, boy, I shot him Tuesday night and and I didn't find him till Wednesday and then ding, 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 you start thinking back and it was 60 degrees Tuesday night um, and now he smells a little bit, for sure you're going to have weakened hair somewhere. So um, the odor will give, give you a red flag to where you want to check extra close. And by the time he gets done telling his story, you will know. If he says, I shot it and had it skinned and in the, hanging in the barn, and after an hour we had it skinned that night and right into the freezer, and here I am to you. You know, that sounds That's good, good. Um, if he's telling you the truth. But... Um, You'll know. You'll have a conversation with the customer on how he got it, and and that will give you an idea. Did you have a question? Yeah, so we have a lot of people tuning in. We've got Derek Wank, who says he got his first batch of XP series with the replacement nose, and he says they are amazing. Ooh. It is for making a great product. Did you see him? Mayor? Wink? His... his Oh, physique? <laughs> Holy smokes, that guy looks better than our XP forms. He's ripped. I did you see that? No. Oh I my did gosh. Not. He had a before and after picture. Oh, I did not see that. Yeah. Good job. I'm going to look like you when I get. <laughs> and then we've got James Caldwell, who is wanting to know what you do with a deer that was hung upside down with ice bags in the chest cavity. Then all that water from the melted ice goes into the face. You're going to cape it out, and you're going to flesh it, salt it, check for slippage, cross your fingers. Um, Something that's bad is epidermal breakdown is caused by bacteria growth. Bacteria needs two parts to cause slippage. One is moisture, which you have with water under the skin. You added a whole lot of moisture. The other thing is a warmer temperature, and a warmer temperature can be 30 degrees and up can be warm enough. But uh, um, moisture and a warmer temperature is cause for slippage. So I think with that, I would tell the customer, here's what we got. We're going to cape him out. I'll 
do it as fast as I can, and we'll, that salt, when you salt that hide, it's going to take the moisture away from those hair roots real fast, and yours is going to take longer because there's so much yeah. moisture under there. Um, yeah. I hate to see people um, have an animal where they spray them down with water because you just added a whole lot of environment for bacteria growth around those yeah. hair roots. All right, we've got a couple more. You just um, keep going. I like questions. So Brad Johnson is wondering how he can get a catalog. Um, he called and there was no answer. We, Our phone lines have been extremely busy. Oh, my gosh. So yes. if you were a current customer as of, I believe it was November 1st, your catalog is coming, and you should be receiving it any day. Um, if you've requested one, it should also, I think our bulk mailing got sent out Monday. Yeah, Monday, I think a big one about. Yeah. Otherwise, you 1,900 can. catalogs went out Monday. That's above the mailing. <laughs> um, otherwise, you can just private message us your mailing address or go on to our website, and we have an area where you can request a catalog. And then we've got Deborah Pence, who is wondering if you can save a cape if it is brought in and there is green. Green? Yes. Why is there green? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, green is not the, the best color you want to see. Um, there again, if it's green, I'm going to bet you have an odor. And I'm going to bet you have possibly bacteria growing somewhere. Um, along those lines, we get coyotes in, and they're very green in the stomach area, and they come out fine, you know, and they have a terrible very odor very also. Uh, but a green on a deer, um, proceed, tell the customer what you're dealing with, and just watch it along the lines. Yeah, be ultra careful with everything. Make sure you get good salt to it. Get it done super quick. Um, let it drain. Make sure and elevate the cape so that the moisture drains away from it as quick as possible. Is that it for questions? Mm -hmm. Good job. I like your questions. Um, okay, customer came in, you checked it all over, you kind of got an idea of, of any damage to point out to him. You're going to want to record all this for the customer as well as for you. Um, this is our invoices that we um, fill out for customers. And it's got, um, up at the top, it's got everything on here um, abides by the state, you know, fish and game laws um, for Iowa. But it's got the date it was received. It's got his name, street, city, state, zip, all that. Um, daytime telephone, email address. The state doesn't ask for email addresses. It's got extra things on here. Um, date of kill. I think every state asks for a date of kill. And what they want to do is they want to make sure that um, the deer was killed during the season, you know, all that kind of thing. This is going to coincide with what that guy has on his harvest tag and all that sort of thing. Um, mount description. You want to know um, how this person wants to mount his deer. Some of them have no idea, and I'll, oftentimes I will say... Um, um, you don't need to make a decision now, but let us know. You know, we'll get it tanned and first and make sure everything's good and stop in or give us a call later. Those are the ones that we're always waiting for when it comes time to mount a deer and their deer is ready and they haven't decided yet. Yeah. Um, seems like the ones that already know, um, you know, they, they have an idea in their mind. Either they've had one already mounted and they want this one to match it or whatever. <clears throat> but... So you try to get an idea of, of pose. Um, a lot of times one side is stronger than the other. Um, this side over here is forked like a, like a mule deer. And if we turned him a little bit to the left, you could camouflage that ear, that half of an ear. Uh -huh. um, and you could emphasize that. You know, that's a good yeah. idea. Um, but the customer will have his own idea. And they come in. All kinds of different versions from all kinds of different companies. They come in sneaks, semi-sneaks, um, offsets, straight off the walls, um, semi-uprights, uprights, yeah. wall pedestals, pedestals. You bet. Frank Fulmer is wondering if we will have any straight-on deer forms in the future. 
You know, we've talked about that and talked about yeah. that and talked about that. And, and our sculptors are not eager to jump on that. Um, I think we should have a line of straight, yes. especially in the common sizes. So if we do, we may in a, you know, seven it's a ways and a half, out. 18, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we have talked about that. And, yeah. and uh, we have a lot of customers oftentimes come in, I'll just do it yeah. straight. And usually, usually it's because they don't know, so we kind of can talk them into a little we, turn to a left yeah. or right. We talk our customers into a little bit of turn um, mm -hmm. when we get the chance, but our a straight semi, gear is difficult to mount. It is. It's the hardest thing I think there is to mount. Um, our semi upright is what I think we usually lean toward slight when turn. they want yep. when they want a straight because it gives it just a slight gives turn them a little and, attitude. Yeah. Um, so so back to back to this. Get your mount description on there. What they want and always I always tell people. You're sitting on him like a horse. Which way is he looking? You know, um, after they go home and they told you left turn, you think back, did, were they, you know, how were they looking? You know, customers do not think like taxidermists do. So that's why it works for me. Just say, okay, you're riding him like a horse. Is he looking left or right? You know, that works good for, for my customers. Um, base description sometimes on a wall habitat or a wall um, pedestal, you might have a little habitat they want on there, anything extra. Um, then your price. Make sure that you get the price written down and I want the customer to see it. Um, I usually try to put that down right away so that you don't spend 45 minutes talking to him about how he got his deer, everything, poses, all that kind of thing, and then you tell him the price and he goes, whoa, my wife's not going to go for that. So I like to have it up front right away. Get the price on there tax. If you're doing any of this stuff like building antlers, um, I mean, we could, if we wanted to, we've replaced ears. We could put a new ear on that. We've got ears. Um, all different kinds. You want an open mouth? You want a Fleming buck? I mean, there's all kinds of different versions you can do that is going to add to this. Um, so write all of that down. Typically, we ask for a 50% deposit. Um, on a $750 deer, if they gave me a couple hundred dollars, I, I will go for that. That doesn't bother me at all. Um, but you do want a substantial deposit down so that they're committed to pick this up. And you have probably yeah. eaten as much stuff as I have. <laughs> um, probably not. Um, but uh, um, you want them committed. Yeah. And you have to buy forms. You have to buy... Um, you have to pay tanning, you have to pay shipping, salt, labor that you worked on. You That's, know. I think, a big thing that people don't consider is their labor on the front end before they ever get this deer done. Somehow you've got to get that paid for, too. It's nice to have a little bit of labor. Some people just take material deposits, but it's nice to have a little front end labor deposit, too. Um, this is another version of a ticket. This one I just made up, and... Uh, just from stuff that I thought I needed more room because I, I use these for 30 years, I think. These are from, I think, New, New you can get them any business supply, but New England business supply, and we'd get them in triplicates. And there, there was a pink one, there was a yellow one, and there was a white one. So I would write up the person's, all his information on there, but it didn't have all of the things that the state required. That's why I made up my own. <clears throat> then I'd write everything on here that I needed. Then I would give them the pink copy. The yellow copy goes in chronolog chronological order on the desk in a box. So if I don't, I can't remember that guy's name. I know he brought it in first part of October. I can go to the first part of October and I can find it chronologically because I forgot his name. Or if I know his name, the white one goes into a file alphabetical order. Um, so that always kind of covered me, and I would never lose a ticket. But uh, these are inexpensive. You can get them from any office supply, and I would get the triplicates. These we made up, and uh, um, we just run over to the copier, lay it in the copier, give him the copy, and this one goes in our file. So that when it's time to do this deer or order forms, we will pull this out. We usually make a copy to go by, and then we'll order the form, and we'll do all of our labor and everything on this.
We have Bob who is wondering if we sell any of those forms to fill out for the customer. No, but if you if you let us know, I'd be happy to stick one of these in your next order, and you can you can change your name on here, put change your little logo, or take them to your stationery store and and have them run off. I'm not attached to them; it just works for me. It's not like it's an invention or anything, but <laughs> they work good. It works good for us. Yeah. Okay. Then, in addition to this. That tells you how to do it and, and all the guys' information. Then you need to tag. We need some kind of a tag on this deer. And you can use, there's a whole different kind of, all different kind of tags. There's um, those little waterproof tags like the locker plants use that you can write on. Um, we made these up, and these are tieback. They can't, can't tear them, can't break them. And uh, they hold ink very, very well. And I usually fill these out. It's got um, customer's license number, the state, name, address, all that kind of stuff, what it is, date killed, signature. And then what I like to do is write the person's name on here in black Sharpie. And then I wrap it around the horn, around the tine. And I tape it with packaging tape, and it stays on. You can see here's this guy's tag, and it'll stay on until we mount this deer. That way it's tagged. Another thing, and I think it's our giveaway today, which is a, a pretty neat way of marking your horns or hides, are these um, red locking tags. They're almost like harvest tags. They're like uh, license tags. And they lock together. They're all numbered. So you'd have a notebook with the guy's name and the tag that his antlers or hide is, is numbered. He might be number 0086315. And you just write that number down. And this can't come off unless you cut it off. These are neat little, I mean, some states have these type of a tags. Rather, before they went to the paper tags, they used to all have that. Yeah. I mean, you could use that for your cape, too. Sure. For the antlers and for the cape. And make a little hole in your cape, slide that tag through, snap it shut, and write it in your notebook so the customer okay. will have a um, tag for his antlers. And this is our giveaway today also. James Hibbert would like to know what are details in your disclaimer? Oh, my details in my disclaimer. My disclaimer, if I think he's talking about what I think he's talking about, um, this was something that's just been passed down from taxidermist to taxidermist to taxidermist. And it's like I talked to a lawyer and he said it's the same thing as putting at a roller rink not responsible for accidents. And he said the roller rink is 100% responsible for accidents. <laughs> so you can put it up there. It's called a psychological barrier. Um, mine says... Um, we must receive half of the total due before any work is started. Interest rates of 18 per annum will be applied on all accounts unpaid after 30 days. Wow. That should go That's up. like a credit card thing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, conditions of acceptance. In view of the many factors which may have adverse effects on the quality of a trophy, such as primeness, general condition of the specimen, climate, and most importantly, the lack of knowledge by the sportsman, as well as facilities in the field, um, Matuska Tax Stream assumes no responsibility for the trophy, whether natural or inflicted by the sportsman or anyone assisting in trophy preservation. Um, I give permission, and then he signs it, I give permission to MTS to use my mount photos and social media and marketing. That I didn't put in there. <laughs> that the girls must have put that in there. Um, and a lot of people have not responsible for losses or um, incurred by tanning. Tanneries yeah. can lose hides, you know. Um, not very often, but it can happen or get destroyed. Um, there's just so much that can go wrong, but that's what our disclaimer says. Okay, now you're getting ready to tan, I bet, aren't you? We got a blizzard to drive through yet. I know. We got 50 we got mile an hour winds. Um, another thing you might find helpful is there's measurements that are necessary to order a form. And and most of them, we don't have the, the neck or we don't have 
anything to go by much, but what we do have is we have the head, and it's very handy to have some measurements yeah. off of the head. Um, the one that our forms, all of our forms, we have six and three quarter inch nose to eye, we have seven, seven and a quarter, seven and a half, seven and three quarters, um, eights. Anyway, it's pretty easy, and I talked to two people last week who have never taken a facial measurement. And, and that's not a problem if all of your deer are the same measurement, but, um, and you can always go up a quarter inch. You can stretch up a quarter. You can condense down a quarter. But what if you got one of them, I mean, out here we get them, I call them farmland deer that have an eight inch nose to eye. And you ordered, uh, once upon a time, Joe Combs, being from down south, had very small faces. And I had, I went through a lot of clay. <laughs> that's Caitlin, did you have something for me? Well, we have a few questions. You can just go right ahead. So the first one is from Tony, and he is wondering how long can a deer paint be on the head in a freezer before the eyes and ears get to the freezer to still be worth thawing and skinning? Um, if it's wrapped real good, a year is a long time, but you could do it. Um, don't give up on those you can inject water under that skin with a needle. And, and by getting the needle up in those dry spots, um, we have skinned some things, and they turned out exceptional <laughs> that should have gone to the dump. Yeah. You know, they were that no fun, good. But... So don't give up on them if they're dried out. The thing that will give you fits is the ears. Um, mm -hmm. But my thinking is we salt these capes to take the moisture out of the hide, which will... Um, is one of the environments, you know, of, of slippage. You've got to get your moisture out of the hide. Okay, if your ear's all dried up already, it's Moisture's not going to slip. Yeah. So we will put them right into a pickle like that, and by injecting and by slowly turning, like over the course of days, every day pull him out, work him a little bit farther, we have taken ears that were like jerky and turned them inside out. Um, so it's more of a patience thing, but um, you can save a lot of things. Yeah, but well wrapped, probably a year. Yeah, um, and that would be the whole thing wrapped. Um, I'd be real careful and make sure that you're enclosing both the tines and the face because anywhere that air can get in there, it will dehydrate quicker. Um, do you have another question? Yeah, we've got a couple on YouTube, actually. So. We have somebody who is um, wondering which chemical you made for the animal's body structure. That would be a that would be a tanning pickle. Mm -hmm. That's a involved process, and we probably should do that. Um, we yeah, haven't done that we'll, for a long we'll time. We'll take you through the tanning process. So the choices are: once we get this cape off, salt it, send it to the tannery, or we we'll tan it ourselves, and we'll mm -hmm. show you we'll show you how to do that in another segment. And then we have, let's see, what is the easiest thing to mount for someone just getting started? <laughs> you have a great answer for that. What is it? Um, the easiest thing a to is, <laughs> no, maybe, <laughs> maybe just fill it up with foam. Um, no, it's something Oh, the that you thing know, you know the least about. Or the most. Or the most, yeah. <laughs> um, most would be, it's so the, hardest, the easiest thing to mount would be the thing that you know the most about. If you're a great deer hunter, you spend a lot of time in the woods, you know what a deer looks like, you look close, closely at them um, six months out of the year, a deer is probably going to be a lot easier for you than a, a duck or a pheasant sure. or um, something that you're not as familiar with. So, If you've um, never done it before, just start out slow yeah. and expect some frustration. It's, taxidermy is not a simple, yeah. simple job. Um, pick something that you have readily available. You can practice a lot. All right, and then the last question we have what? for now is, why is a straight mount harder than any other? For me, it's symmetry because you get them all done and dried, and one ear is, a, I mean, an eighth of an inch will jump out at it you. It does. Um, one ear is down farther than the other, mm -hmm. or one eye is tipped one direction farther than the other, or that's my yep. issue anyway. Yeah. Symmetry from right to left is hard. 
Okay, we better get going because you got to think so. Keep we here. You've been looking at the clock. Um, okay, one thing that I think will really, really help you when you order forms is nose to eye. Take this and write it down either on the ticket or in your notebook or somewhere um, from the front corner of the eye to, to the end of the nose and with your tape measure, just lay your tape out. I usually, we usually have a yardstick that we do this on. And this nose to eye is um, a touch over seven and a half. I'd say seven and five eighths. Um, but just write that somewhere. Write it. Um, you can write it on the ticket. You can write it in your hide book where, the, where you mark it for coding. Um, but just record that. Another one that we have found pretty helpful is the width of the eyes between the front corners and I like this because it tells you what the width of the head is and if you get an old deer that's a seven and a half he's usually much wider than a young deer that's seven and a half yeah. um, so I would also write this down and it's four so we call that an E measurement if you look in our catalog um, we have A um, then we have the B and C neck measurements, but then um, we have the E measurement here, which I think is pretty pretty helpful. Yeah. And it's it's the width of the nose. This deer, this is a, a nice mature deer, but this is probably about a four inch um, width of the head, whereas a little yearling, the same length, might be a three and three quarters or three and a half. Yeah. You know, there may be a quarter inch difference in there. Um, and it makes a big difference to the look of the deer. Yeah, quarter inch in face is significant. Um, so take that. Um, another good one that they could take at this point if, if it's not been in the freezer too long and if it's not too misformed is the nose itself. Um, they could take a couple measurements of the width of the nose. Yes. Um, helps them in ordering it should they decide and, they want to use an artificial. And between the nostrils, I've seen you take those. Yeah. I've seen you take the overall width up here. Yeah. I've seen you take the width of the swell. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of nostrils that, or a lot of measurements which are helpful when it goes to mounting yeah. your deer. Yeah. All right, we've got Matt on Facebook who's wondering if the deer comes in like you have it when you take a neck measurement as is. That's difficult. We probably should let you start, start <laughs> yeah, caping. Actually, if I start caping, you can yeah, keep answering. I keep answering questions. All right, go ahead. Um, um, you you kind of explain your process, and we'll get back to questions in a second here. Um, so we're going to cape this deer quick, um, try to get the hide off for you. That's probably as far as we're going to go today. But we're going to do that through a, our standard incision that we use in the shop is a Y incision. Um, there are several different incisions you can use. Um, and those are going to take place right here from on the top of the head between the antler burrs. And there are some that can be taken as a seven, might be an incision that's shaped like that. Um, some people will use a T incision. They'll go right between the antlers and then straight down the back of the neck. Um, we're going to use a, a short Y. It'll come together like this from meat in the center and then go down. We're going to, we'll cape this deer with a short incision. Nice because we don't have a lot of neck meat back here that we have to fight against. So um, I think we can do this through a pretty short, uh, pretty short incision. Um, sometimes it's, and it's up entirely up to you, um, we can start um, through the mouth and start that incision this way, or we can start caping off the back of the neck. Um, we're going to do, we're going to be as Facebook friendly as we can, oh. and um, I think I'm just going to start right back here. So the first thing I'm going to do is, with a good sharp knife, um, I'm going to start right here at the base of the antler, my short Y incision. Can you see that, Caitlin? Right there. And I'm going to stop right in the center. I'm 
going to come back to the other side. And I'm going to go right straight to that one. Hopefully I'm met right in the middle. Look at that. I accidentally worked. That's good. <laughs> um, now, another thing that I'm, I will mention that's kind of important is to take this cape and and lay it out so that you can see the middle of the deer many, many times. Um, if this cape is not laying flat, you could make an incision going down what you think is the back of the neck, and you may get to working on the deer and find out that your incision went way over the back of the ear or something. So I'm going to spread this out as best I can, and you'll see many times on a deer there will be a little bit of a dark streak down the back, down the center of the back. And so I'm going to try to keep to that. Um, now I'm just going to go right here where that, that incision was. If you can see that, I'll tip toward you. And then I'm going to go right through the peak. Go straight down. And I just want to go far enough that I'm past the, the neck. If you had a lot of neck stub, still left the meat in the back of the neck. Um, a lot of people will cut all the way past that meat. You don't necessarily have to. You can cut down halfway down the neck stub and then skin both ways and go around it. Takes a little longer, but um, that works. Um, now I'm going to proceed around the back of the neck over the top of the ears. And I'm going to try to leave as much meat as I can with the skull just so I don't have to deal with it later. I'm also going to skin over the back of the ear as far as I can so that um, when it comes time for me to split the ears, um, I've got a lot of that already done. It's, it's a lot easier to do now um, while I can hold that than it is for me to do later. Um, I'm kind of doing this all upside down so you guys can see it, but it seems a little awkward. Take note, the very, very best reference material that you have, and um, we did have a question about what's the easiest thing to do. Um, we said the easiest thing to do is something you know the most about. Your best reference material is right here, and you can start learning about deer in this very first incision. You can see how muscles connect, where those connecting points are, size of the ear butts, um, all that stuff that we have to rebuild. The answers to the test are right here in front of you, so don't don't skin your first deer super fast. Pay attention to, to some of that information that you have right there. I am going to extend this cut down just another half an inch to help me open it up. There we go. Now I'll go over the other ear. I'll let that antler tip down. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, do you have any other questions for Tom, Caitlin? I'll try and stay right there if you want to leave the camera. The question you asked about taking neck measurements. Um, a lot of people tell me that they take measurements over the hair. And I, that, that's a false reading to me. Some people might make it work. But over the hair, I think you're going to get two to three inches bigger than what that animal really yeah. was. Um, now this one has no neck stub in it. It's like extremely short. So we have not much to measure. Um, in that case, we'll measure the skin. And I like to measure the skin once Brett gets it off, take a measurement on it. Or, um, or in addition, I like to take a measurement once it's neutralized. And you can usually make it get a pretty close reading. So we do have a, another question from Donnie Weber, and they're wondering if he takes a measurement from the tip of the nose in the center and to the antler tips for antler installation. Do you have any other recommendations? Um, no, a lot of people will do that. They will take a measurement from the center of the nose to the tip of the main beam on the left, center of the nose to the tip of the main beam on the right. When they get their mannequin, they will put their horns on 
and before they affix them permanently, they will position them and then check those measurements that you wrote down when you first caped the deer. And that is a really good idea provided your nose to eye is exactly what that deer was and provided that the, the spacing or the location that you put your skull plate on the top of the plate is the same as what that deer was. Um, there are times when you can line them up perfectly and the angle is not even close to what that deer was in real life. Okay. I am going to, I'm real quick, about over the ears, so I'm going to see if maybe Caitlin can watch here. Um, so I have the Y split open like that. I've gone over the back of the ear about as far as I can go. Now I'm going to detach the ear from the skull and I'm going to do that fairly tight. This is the center here. Um, you'll feel this is hard bone. I'm going to cut right against that like this. And I am going to detach right at the ear canal. And that will be right up here. And ideally, we'll cut this ear canal off. You can see it right there, Caitlin. I can get in there. There's a very small opening right there, and that's where the ear canal went into the skull. Um, and we want to cut that off um, where that's fairly small. If you cut that off higher, um, the opening might be as big around as your thumb, um, and that's up a little high. Um, this is perfect. This is kind of what we're looking for, about as big around as your little finger maybe. So I'll go around that just a little bit. And I'm also going to, at this point, I need to start detaching from the antler burr. I like to come under the antler burr with the very tip of the knife, just a little ways. And then I like to pull. After I've got the, after I've got the ear detached, I'll just pull that away like this. And that way you don't have a whole bunch of cuts all the way around and it doesn't get real ragged. You can see I pulled that for oh, an inch and a quarter or more around that antler base, so I don't have a real ragged antler base. I do try to keep those pretty clean. A lot of people use a screwdriver. Oh, man, they do. I've done it once, and it went into my hand. <laughs> That's the worst. That is the very worst. Um, so now um, I'm just going to do the same thing around the other side. Go this way, and you might... Kate, I'm going to have to get in front of you for just a second, so this might not be real pretty. Maybe Tom wants to, yeah. you can, maybe you've got a question for Tom while I do the same thing. So we've got a question on YouTube, and Tyson is wondering how you get an accurate eye and nose measurement if you just have the cape to measure off of. Ooh, that's harder. Um, and that skin stretches like crazy. If you've been in taxidermy very long, you probably have some mannequins in the shop that you didn't use. And, and like when we teach students here, um, a lot of the capes that we purchase for students to mount um, were taken off of the carcass and there's no measurements whatsoever. So when we get into the tanning process and ready to order a form, we will slide those neutralized or tanned capes on one of our forms. And even if you just have one, if you have a seven and a quarter inch nose to eye, you will know if it's way too small or perfect or way too big. So it's kind of nice to have um, a head laying around or even a change out head we have a large variety of change out heads that we carry and they're inexpensive and just to have a couple of these in the shop is real nice to be able to slide that cape on and see how everything lines up. Other than that, it's going to be a, a guess. All right, now we have Gage who is wondering what your favorite, you said nice, but I think he meant knife, is to use to skin out the skull. Yeah. We, have, we have a lot of favorites. Um, yours, and this is a, was this a Russell? Is that what it was? Um, no, it's, oh, what is it we Dexter? carry? Yeah, 
yep. Dexter. Um, it did not look like this when he started <laughs> with it. it. The shape is way different. Um, years of sharpening and using it over and over um, has turned it into the perfect knife for Brett to get under the antler burrs. <clears throat> but that was a... Um, um, I mean, we've had that those kind forever and ever. Yeah. There's a lot of different kind of good knives. Um, one of my favorites is, and we've used these for years, is the Chicago Cutlery Pairing Knife. And these are much different when they're brand new also. Um, we've skinned everything from moose to wolves to African animals. I took it to Africa. Um, um, caribou, deer, everything with that knife. Um, there's so many good knives out there anymore. I don't know if um, and inexpensive more than too. Inexpensive. I mean, you don't have yeah. to have a super expensive knife to for caping. Um, I believe we have a whole selection of Weeby knives, and uh, there's some with disposable blades. If you have difficulty sharpening a knife, um, they have disposable blades, just like scalpels. Um, there's a there's a huge selection of I mean, our knife selection would rival <laughs> yeah, packing, Smoky Mountain knife works. packing plant supply. We've got some yeah. beautiful, beautiful knives. We do. Um, typically, very sharp, very, the shorter for what we're doing here, I like a shorter knife. Um, I don't want to get any longer than this probably with a, maybe a four-inch blade. Um, shorter knives seem to be easier to wield around there. And then when you get into... Uh, um, Fleshing and things, that's a whole another segment of knives. Um, real quick, Kate, I've just started to come around the front of the antler burr. I opened up the, the top of the head um, and did the same thing. I just kind of loosened things up in front of the antler, and then I just used my thumb and kind of pushed around the, around the base, and that way, again, I don't have a lot of cuts there. Um, right here above the eye, I will have to cut up from, from the skull toward the antler burr. Um, and when you do that, you just want to make sure your knife is laying against the skull so that you're not cutting into your hide. Um, I'm just going to loosen that up just a little bit. This one has very, this one has competition antler burrs. And if you guys have competed before, you know what I'm talking about. They overlap tremendously. You could hide You'd have a lot of shrinkage down there, and you'd never see it. Um, so I'm just going to slide that knife right up under the edge. Go forward. I'm about a quarter of an inch from touching, so I'm just going to connect those two from the front and get that off completely like that. So that's disconnected all the way around. I will go back and do the same thing on the other side. I bet most of the guys that do this very often would have already had this thing done, taken well, off. And when you're showing. Showing somebody and talking, it goes very slow. <laughs> it does go much slower than it should. Okay, we've got a few questions. James is wondering if it would be better to measure the neck after shaving. Yeah, 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 I think so. Um, for me, the, the safest and most accurate you're going to get is probably right after you neutralize it. If you're if you're talking about shaving it now, like maybe would take this on the machine and flush it, um, you can get a green measurement, which tend, it tends to stretch very, very, almost too well. Um, my safest measurement is after it's neutralized or when it's back from the tannery. But yes, after shaving. Sure, and and like uh, as far as caping, predators you don't have antlers to go around, but we would still um, skin them in a similar fashion. All right, and then we have another question from James. 
person who's wondering if a deer comes in with a lot of neck, do you take that out so your cut isn't that long? I guess if you wanted a short cut, what I would have to do is make my incision in the back, keep it short, but get it past the atlas vertebrae, the first vertebrae, and then separate the skull from that vertebrae and take the skull out just as Brett is, but the remainder stump of the neck is going to stay in the neck tube, which you haven't skinned out, and then you'll, because you don't have the, the mass of the head to come out through there and the mass yeah. of the neck, um, you'll be able to get that, turn that inside out and get that portion of the neck out separately. Um, we've done like raid, right? Yeah. Um, we don't. Um, you guys, some of you guys are going to think we're crazy, but we don't have ticks on our hides. And uh, um, I had a customer, or not a customer, a friend, taxidermist of mine um, from the Des Moines area, and he said, uh, "What do you do with all those tick rubs where the ticks, the deer rub the ticks off, and they sh they grind their hair off and ruin their hair?" And I, I literally did not know what he was talking about. And he said, do you paint those areas or do you glue in hair or what? And I, I said, I don't think I know. We don't get that. And he literally didn't believe me because 200, 200 miles south, it's very, very common. Yeah. And the only time we see it is when somebody brings a deer up from southern Iowa. But around here, our deer... Um, Typically, we'll see a tick from now, you know, time and again, but um, rarely do we have any damage from ticks. Um, but if we have ticks on them, um, you can freeze them, but you have to freeze them yeah. for a long time because a tick can survive dormancy for a while. Um, otherwise, raid or put them in a bag with raid or something overnight, I think will do it. But I'm not very versed on ticks. I know. We, fortunately, we don't, get we them. don't have them. Like, knock, knock, like knock. Those I Missouri. feel sorry for you taxidermists that are in terrible ticks. I mean, we have wood ticks, but we don't seem to have the deer ticks. No. Um, but I feel sorry for you people that battle those hides with all the damage from ticks. That is no fun. No fun at all. all right, we've got a few more questions. You just keep, keep them okay. coming. We've got John is wondering when ordering bulk such as ears, eyes, horns, etc., is it best to call online or via the app? Um, I mean, all three are really great for your order. It's really whatever you prefer. Um, yeah, I don't think there. You know, it just depends if you you know want to type in all your items or you prefer to call in, but. Your app has been, it's been wildly popular. Yeah, very good. I think it's people sit in a tree stand and just <laughs> push the app. Um, but we're we're always here too if they want to call and have a specific question about availability or things like that. Um, uh, girls are always available. So I'm just going to come, not to interrupt, but I'm going to come back around the back side of this. This deer's still a little frozen, um, but I'm going to come around here and. I'm not quite to the eye orbit on this side. I am on the other. Like I said, we're going to try to stay pretty Facebook friendly so we don't get in trouble. You're but past that. <laughs> am I? <laughs> Hopefully nobody turns us in. Um, but at this point here, Kate, I'm going to try and keep within your view. Um, you can see the back of the eye orbit is right there. The eye would sit in front of that. And I'm going to reach in from the other side from here. I'm going to put my finger right on the edge of the eye rim and pull that away from the bone. So my finger is here. I'm on the eyelid. So I know that if I cut on this side of my finger, I am not going to cut anything important. So I can continue to pull that finger. skin away. <laughs> if I cut my finger, um, then I know I'm getting a little bit too close. 
So I'm going to continue to do that. I'm going to pull this little apron of skin, which we like to tuck. Um, we like to tuck our eyelids, and so we're going to pull this apron of skin away that we'll use to tuck later. And you can see I've just come through it now. And I'm going to pull that away. Pull away all the way down here. I can't believe Kate is getting in here and watching this. She's doing super good. And I'm all the way to the front. Now, I like to make sure that there's the nictitating membrane. I like to make sure that I'm going to leave as much of the front corner of the eye apron as possible. To do that, I'm going to take the tip of the knife and I'm going to come in right here and just pull that skin away like that. And now go back right to skinning against the bone. Keep the tip of your knife against, against the bone itself. You'll see a little, there's a little gland right there in the front corner. And immediately after the front corner of the eye, I'm gonna run into the lacrimal crease and I'm gonna start pulling that away as well. I like to pull as much as possible because that's gonna show you where you can cut in that membrane. Um, I'm gonna keep separating that right against the bone. And you'll see, um, right now I'm cutting with just the very tip of the knife if I were to make a hole now, it would be tiny. It would be with just the tip of the knife versus cutting with the wide, with the wide cut of the knife. That wouldn't leave me a great big hole. So I'm, I will hold this knife up and down. I think that's something that Tom teaches the very first week in class. Little holes. We're going to make little holes. holes. We make little holes. <laughs> we'll make plenty of holes, but hopefully they're little ones. Um, and now I'm right over the top, so. I'll go back around the other side. If we've got some more questions, we can answer those, and I'll just repeat that same process. All right, so we have Jesse who is saying that he didn't take measurements on a coon he's working on. Is he doomed? Oh, in heaven's no. <laughs> um, no, but the more measurements you take, the easier this business is. Um, so once you flesh that coon and Jesse, I don't know what you're going to do for tanning it, if you're going to commercial tan it or tan it yourself, but, but when it's ready to mount, when you've got it fleshed and you've got him all the fat and, and tissue removed and lips split, ears turned, and it goes into the, the you know, whatever kind of tan you're using, whether you're using rub-on tan or whatever, at that point, um, you're going to want to take some really, really good measurements. And the problem for you is going to be that you're going to look in a catalog and they've got a, oh, let's say a 19 by 24 inch coon. And you can stretch him to 24 inches, but you've only got 14 inches of width. Um, it's because that stretches like rubber. When you stretch it lengthways, you lose girth. When you stretch it widthwise, you lose length. So you're going to have to figure out um, a combination of measurements of width and, and length that's going to fit your hide. And um, just because you get a form that doesn't fit, um, then, then you have other skills you're going to have to rely on, and that's building it up or shrinking it down and maintaining the anatomy. And then we have Trey, who is wondering if you turn your cape after you take off the skull or your freeze and turn later. I wonder if he means ears and lips I and think, stuff. I bet that's what he's saying, yeah. We don't like to put them into the freezer again. We like to finish them to a salting stage, correct? Yeah, and usually we don't, if we don't have to freeze them, we won't. Most yeah. of our customer deer are our cape the day that they come in, if they're if at all possible, um, just because of that working time. See, that's a that's something I've always said. This deer, especially deer that have a lot of neck meat in them, um, in order to freeze, when we stick them, we got a big walk-in freezer, and we can put them in a bag and we can freeze them. But that that skin and that epidermis really doesn't freeze fast. It's going to freeze in an hour to two hours, that's an hour to two hours that it can still be aging. Um, and then when you take it out to thaw it, 
you really, how long did this one? <laughs> Two days. <laughs> to, to thaw. And there's parts of that deer which are not protected during that time. So we don't like to freeze them if we don't have to. Um, Kate, I've got a, one little thing to show them quick here. If you want to. If you want to. Um, I've just pulled away from that lacrimal crease right here. I've got that skin pulled away. And now I'm going to come down uh, the side of the face. And I, and I like to pull as much as possible um, that you don't have to cut. And we're going to come right to the back of the mouth um, and start pulling that away. Um, I'm not seeing our 50 mile an hour winds. I haven't heard it. Which I get as many orders out today as we could. Okay. Um, so I'm now to the back of the mouth, which is right here, and I'm just going to pull that skin away, expose those papillae, and we're going to go right down the teeth and stay right against the bone. This will go pretty quick. Um, and we'll do that on both the top jaw and the bottom. I like to, on occasion, start inside the mouth. Um, I will start caping the deer, the very first thing, and I'll go detach the nose, skin along the, the gum line, um, just short of the tear ducts, and then I'll flip him over and start that Y incision and skin from that side. And that, that might be a good way, kind of works well to teach because you can see rather than going from the inside out where it's harder for you to see like this, um, you can see from the inside exactly what you're cutting. So um, if you want to go back to some questions, I'm just going to proceed down to the nose the same way on the opposite jaw. All right. Dana is wondering if you are going to replace the ear on this ear, and will you be showing that process? No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> but, but, um, the customer will like the ear and it was character. Some, some customers will want to fix everything to make the animal perfect. And some people say, no, that's the way he was. And I want him to remember him like he was. So this, this particular person wants him left. And I would encourage you to encourage your customer not to have uh, we to have done the ear. ears. We and have done we, that. Um, we would get another deer and we would save a good ear that, I mean, typically they match. You know, you're looking at the white, you know, curly hair in the front and, and um, we would tan it just like we would the entire cape. We've even taken replacement ears and zip tied them to the remainder of the cape. So when yep. they're in the pickle or they go to the tannery, they receive Stay the same together. treatment. Yep. And then what worked best for me is to cut the the bad ear out in a square rather than a round yeah. circle because a round circle you can get them rotated funny and with a square you've got points to line up. Um, we used to, we haven't done it for a while, we used to do a we've lot done, of yeah, re ear replacements. Um, okay, if you want to look one more time, I think this will be um, quickly our last little step if we want to show them. Um, the first thing I have to do is I'm going to take this cape off of the nose and we're going to cut through the nostril. Um, I'm just at the end of the bone here. Facebook police are going to get you. <laughs> I hope not. Um, this is one of those deer that hung upside down and all that moisture is up in the face. You can really feel it in caping it. There's a lot of moisture on the table. There's a lot of moisture as I'm skinning. He, that he did hang upside down for quite a while it looks like. Um, now I'm just going to detach uh, the nose by cutting through the cartilage. I'm going to cut straight down to the bone through the septum. And I'll do that straight across. That might be harder to see. I've got it tipped on a funny angle, but like that. And then I'll follow the lip line and bring that forward. Sorry, I talk so much. <laughs> we, had a lot of questions. we did have a lot of questions. This was before the questions. <laughs> um, but, uh, I think we have a lot of viewers too, which is kind of nice. 
That's what everything you do so. here is probably the most important thing you do with the whole mount. Really, really Trophy is. care, how to, how to get this off and preserve that hide. And now I'm just going to come around the front. I'm going to detach it from the front of the teeth right at the gum line. And I'll do the same thing on the bottom. Um, it's not real pretty uh, to show you. But uh, pretty simple. Just follow the gum line. Follow the teeth. And, and we'll have this off in just a second. And this person wanted to um, save the bottom jaw for aging. Oh man, that's that's one of the that's why we like to make sure and run off a copy of that receipt because if this had been in your freezer for very long, it's real simple to throw this, cut these antlers off, throw them away, and leave for the night. Um, but yeah, this we need to save this bottom jaw with the antlers. So I got the top loose, and now I'm just going to go down the jawline on the front and do the same thing. Life is a little dull. Um, you'll find that you want to have a good steel handy um, as you're cutting against the bone. Um, we've talked about knife sharpening before and, and uh, you can see how much of a difference that made for me. Um, we're just going to leave a good half an inch or more of skin apron on this. And uh, oh, got it. That's it. Good job. <laughs> that was... Painful. I hope it wasn't as painful for them to watch as it was for us to do. Um, and there we go. Now we would probably at this point, just for future reference, some people had asked about measurements. We do like to take a green neck measurement um, and we'll take that with a yardstick. We'll, we will pull him out like so and then put a yardstick in here at the back of the neck and take a quick measurement um, through that in incision just as a reference. That's, we probably wouldn't order a form off of that, but it does give us an idea if this deer goes to the tannery and for some reason he uh, came back with an 18 inch neck, um, we'd know something was going on. So our first, first measurement would be right behind the ears. So unfold that skin and put the yardstick in there and Without stretching and without doing any pulling at all, I mean, there's 21 right there. Yeah. So we know he's got to be at least 21. The next measurement down is over that atlas. And just by stretching it out and letting it sit there, I'm pretty easy at 23. Yeah. So we would jot that down. Don't go by it. We're going to confirm it after we tan him and everything. But... Uh, that's handy to have. If you get uh, back from the tannery a 21 inch, or I mean a 19 inch cape or an 18 inch cape, um, you'll know something's wrong. Something's awry. Um, and worth noting too, when we cut this off, um, all of the arm, but we stay right here behind the leg. We left ourselves plenty. Um, you don't have to leave quite that much, but better safe than sorry. What um, advice would you give to your hunters that are watching? Um, don't screw it up. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, get it to a taxidermist as fast as you can. Yep. Don't let it lay around. Yep. Think about what Tom was mentioning earlier, bacteria growth. Heat and moisture are your enemies. Stay away from moisture. Stay, get it cold as fast as you can. Um, make your decisions based on that. As far as cutting-wise, when they do it themselves in the field, what advice would you give them? Leave plenty. Leave plenty high. Don't cut throats. Um, when I first started in taxidermy, every customer cut the throats to bleed the deer. Every customer did. Um, if I had 20 deer in, I probably had 17 of them with cut throats. Oh. And why do you not cut the throats? Well, because the taxidermists can't. They cut all the hair on the outside, and yeah. the taxidermist has a hard time yeah. hiding that. And that's, It'd yeah. be, it's bad. They don't do that anymore. So where do you cut to bleed it out then? Um, it they usually, I mean, if it's a, a bow shot deer, it bled out. That's what killed it. Um, yeah. If it's a gunshot deer, you know, they gut them immediately bleed. anyway, yeah. and they're, they're bled out. Yeah, they typically bleed. That's most of the reason. It's not necessary. Um, like, 
people used to think. Yeah. Pointy end goes into the deer, not the fingers. Uh, remember to like and share this video for a chance to win. We oh. have a giveaway today. Oh, yeah. And um, your catalogs are on the way. We have another bulk mailing for those that have ordered a catalog since then. That should be going out in the next week. Um, so just remember to like and share this video for your chance to win. And also just to share a video so that people so learn. And this is a giveaway, right? It's a giveaway. for specimen tags, 100 pack. 100 of them. And I would use them. I'd use one for the, for the horns and one for the hide. So, so this customer in the book, he'd, I'd write down horns are um, 316, hides 315. Snap them on. They are not going to come off unless you make them come off. Yeah. Who's the winner? Our winner is Ann Helm. Oh, Ann. Congratulations. Congratulations. You like them. Um, another thing on... We are super busy. We're supposed to get a snowstorm tomorrow, but just for all of our awesome customers, thanks for being so understanding and patient with us Ooh. because we are working so hard at getting all the orders. We had to add another phone line. It's still not done yet. Tomorrow, he said. Tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, because I can't even call people out to say we're out of stuff. Um, then we're going to have to add a person then to we have answer to add the people. phone. <laughs> But just, we appreciate that, and thanks for understanding, because we are super busy, but just know that we are working as hard as we can. We have a night shift. We do. And Two also, shifts. if you guys need stuff out right away, just plan ahead. Please plan ahead, because <laughs> to rush in front of all the other people is just super hard for us right now. So plan ahead, and thank you, thank you, thank you. And we'll catch you what's next week. I think next week we'll probably proceed um, yeah. on what to, what to do from this point on. To get him in the salt. Yeah. We'll probably take care of this hide so it doesn't lay around. We'll get out another yeah. one, I think. Yeah. Awesome. Tune in next Thanks, week. everybody.